there, Visual Politic fans. A short time ago, here on this channel, we published our own rankings of some of the most dangerous cities in the world. Deciding the list is always complicated, and it forced us to choose between many candidates that perhaps, unfairly, were left out. What can I say? To be fair, Mexico alone would have needed an entire video. North of its border, there are also many cities that deserve our attention. In the past video, we mentioned St. Louis, a city we have already talked about here on Visual Politic. We also could have made room in the ranking for cities like Memphis, Detroit, Chicago, or perhaps, and especially, Baltimore. But of course, how could we dedicate just one minute to Baltimore when one of the best TV series dedicated five full seasons to it. Of course, we're talking about The Wire. I'm sure many of you have already seen it, and those of you who haven't, check it out, because boy oh boy, is it worth it. The thing is, the last episode of that series dates back to 2008, and since then, many things have happened. So much that they're launching an entire new production. The Wire creator returning to Baltimore for new HBO series, We Own This City. As is happening in the United States as a whole, violence has skyrocketed in Baltimore. In 2021 alone, 338 homicides were recorded. As a comparison, in New York, there were 485. The difference is that in New York, there are 15 times more people than in Baltimore, which has fewer than 600,000 inhabitants. We're talking about a city that in the 1950s numbered around 1 million inhabitants. But of course, between those who die and those who leave Baltimore, the city is losing population. Worst of all, the bad news does not end there. There are more and more abandoned houses, more drugs on the streets, and less future for its young people. So the question is, are we talking about the most decadent and violent city in the United States? What what are the Baltimore authorities doing to change the situation? More importantly, is it having any effect? Today on Visual Politic, we're going to answer all of these questions. But first, let's take a look at some history. The Wire. Are you looking to buy a house? Well, you're in luck. With just $200,000, you can buy one in the heart of Baltimore. But be careful, because your American dream could turn into a nightmare at any moment. The 19th century brick townhouses that abound in the western part of the city are now a desolate sight. Many are abandoned. They were once the dream home of thousands of European immigrants who came to Baltimore during its rapid industrial growth in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It was a time when the largest city in the state, Maryland, became one of the most prosperous places in the United States thanks to its factories, its steel production, and its port. And so, in 1950, Baltimore was the sixth largest city in the United States. However, a third of its inhabitants migrated as its shipping and steel industries closed. Baltimore's crisis then worsened further in the 1970s and 80s when heroin, cocaine, and crack cocaine began to circulate in abundance on its streets. In this way, drug addiction spread to the poorest neighborhoods in the west side of the city, where radical laws and clearly racist housing policies had concentrated the African-American population, which, by the way, accounts for about two-thirds of all current inhabitants. Baltimore's decline over the last few decades is evident. Despite having been one of the great cities in the United States and having such valuable assets as the prestigious Johns Hopkins University, its port commerce and such attractive areas as Fells Point, the truth is that the problems continue to multiply. In the 1990s, other major US cities such as New York were successful in their fight against crime thanks to a combination of economic prosperity, reduced alcohol consumption, and increased police pressure. Meanwhile, Baltimore sank lower and lower. The numbers speak for themselves. And here, they indicate that one-eighth of Baltimore's population is addicted to narcotics and that the city has the highest rate of venereal disease in the country as well as one of the highest homicide rates. To make matters worse, since 1990, Baltimore has lost more than 75,000 industrial jobs that have not been made up for by other activities. As a result, a significant portion of its residents have been trapped in poverty. In the most depressed neighborhoods in this city, more than half of the adults are unemployed and half of the adolescents are regularly absent from school. To give you an idea, a study conducted by sociologists at John Hopkins University concluded that only 4% of children from the most deprived areas of Baltimore managed to finish college. Only 4%. These are terrible figures that represent an enormous blow to the social programs promoted by the Democratic Party. And that, in view of what these numbers show, have been of practically no use. Democratic politicians have controlled Baltimore City Hall since 1967. We're talking about 55 years of government that have gone from failure to failure in what was once known as Charm City. At the turn of the century, for example, many hopes were pinned on the mayor Martin O'Malley, a young lawyer of Irish descent. He promised to reduce inequality and clean up the streets with a zero tolerance policy. He urged police to stop young people acting suspiciously and search them for weapons or drugs. And, of course, the police completely embraced zero tolerance. They targeted those who met the two requirements, being young and being black. A profile that, as you can imagine, abounds in Baltimore. And guess what? It got out of hand. 
In 2005 alone, Baltimore police made 100,000 arrests. Remember that we're talking about a city of only 600,000 people. As this rate of arrest was completely unsustainable, O'Malley had to backtrack on this heavy-handed approach to policing. But the damage was done. The plan destroyed confidence in the police throughout much of the city. The result was a perfect climate for gangs, violence, and crime of all kinds. So those who've had the opportunity have not hesitated. They've got out of there. Some 16,000 buildings are officially designated as vacant, but the real numbers could be double that. Entire streets of houses are boarded up. In the last six years alone, 5,000 houses have been demolished. To make matters worse, the credibility of the local institutions has also been shaken. Since 2010, two mayors have resigned after being involved in corruption scandals. To give you an idea, in the last 12 years, Baltimore has had six different mayors and as many political commissioners. A real disaster, which of course has not gone unnoticed. Notice what the president himself said about the city in 2019. Trump attacks another African-American lawmaker and calls Baltimore a disgusting rat and rodent-infested mess. Yeesh. The worst part is that Democratic politicians had nothing to counter him with. Baltimore has become the closest thing to a drug supermarket that money can buy. And if things at the start of the 21st century were already bad since 2015, they've gotten even worse. Check this out. We own this city. You all know who George Floyd is, sadly. But you should know that before George Floyd, there was Freddie Gray and so many others who have been victims of what we might call racial violence at the hand of some police officers in the United States. The point is that in 2015, Freddie Gray, who was only 25, who'd been arrested for carrying a knife, died while in Baltimore police custody as a result of an injury he sustained to his spine while being transported in a police van. It was apparently standard practice for Baltimore police to handcuff arrestees, not protect them with seatbelts, and drive roughly so they were as close to a ball in the trunk as possible, bumping up against each other all over the place. The fact is that mass protests and riots spread throughout the city. It was something like a point of no return. As a result of this event, riots increased by 50%. And now, news stories like this are not uncommon. Baltimore tops 300 homicides for seventh consecutive year. Now hold on a minute. Baltimore is a city where every once in a while a black man is killed by the police, but mostly it is a city where virtually every day a young black man is killed by another black man. Incidentally, many, including a federal government investigation, blame the police themselves for this. Racial bias pervasive among Baltimore police. DOJ says. How is a police force going to ensure security if no one trusts it? If the majority of the inhabitants of a city see it as a hostile institution and refuse to collaborate with it? This is a problem. Incidents of police brutality make it much more unlikely that the residents of black neighborhoods will go to the police to report crimes and cooperate with any investigations. And the same distrust extends to judicial bodies, which logically are closely related to the police themselves. And that's not all. To top it all off, some members of the police force dedicated years to extorting money from innocent people and robbing drug traffickers to take their business. Let's just say they thought they were the lords of the city. Some measures of justice. Baltimore City pays $525,000 to victim who says corrupt GTTF cops wrongly sent him to prison, part of $14 million in settlements. In the end, the economic crisis, job losses, narcotics, and political corruption fueled the disaster. But wait a moment, because there is still more. Today, violence is fueled by an enemy that goes beyond Baltimore's borders. We are talking about fentanyl, a highly potent synthetic opioid that has largely replaced heroin. It's crazy. In 2021 alone, more than 100,000 people, 100,000 people died in the United States from overdoses. The situation is so dire that in his last State of the Union address, President Biden himself made this a national priority. First, beat the opioid epidemic. There's so much we can do increased funding for prevention, treatment, harm reduction and recovery, get rid of outdated rules and stop doctors and, and the, that stop doctors from prescribing treatments, stop the flow of illicit drugs by working with state and local law enforcement to go after the traffickers. The fact is, in 2007, opioid overdoses claimed the lives of 256 Baltimore residents, mostly from heroin. In 2018, that number had more than tripled to 814 deaths from fentanyl. Baltimore has the highest opioid death rate of any US city, and now it has a plan to reduce it. Whether the plan is any good is another matter. Check this out. Drugs and tax addicts. 
Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott of the Democratic Party wants to address this overdose boom by opening safe injection sites. These are places where people go to consume narcotics. They are there under the supervision of medical personnel who can intervene quickly in case of overdose to prevent death. Imagine how bad things must be for these plans to be put on the table. It's not an original idea, but it is an idea that recently ran into opposition from the Trump administration, which struck down a similar proposal by the city of Philadelphia in federal court. The laws currently in force at the federal level in the United States that open public places for drug use are not allowed. Out. But now, all of that could change with Biden. Justice Department signals it may allow safe injection sites. Members of the Democratic Party who defend these sites argue that trying to save the lives of these people comes before any other consideration. Good intentions are not in question here. But is it really in the best interest of addicts to open a place where they can go into almost anything? It's a difficult question and a controversial one to say the least. And it doesn't look like it can particularly help improve things in Baltimore. Speaking of the future, take a look at this news item. Study finds average earning Baltimore family earns 14.1% of their annual income towards taxes. This means that in Baltimore, they pay 50% more in local taxes than the average large US city. The city has a tax regime with very aggressive progressivity. And overall, the city ranks fourth among the largest US cities with the highest tax burden. Kind of like the golden dream of many Bernie Sanders wing Democrats. This high tax burden has an explanation. As you have seen, the city has been losing population since 1950. So what have the Democratic Party politicians who have run Baltimore since 1967 done? Nothing less than raise taxes to try to maintain city revenues in the face of taxpayer flight. So in addition to the generalized problem of violence, narcotics, lack of job opportunities, we also have the highest taxes in the country. And the question is, who in their right mind is going to want to move to Baltimore? What business or person could survive in such circumstances? What person could thrive? But of course, high taxes drive out more professionals and reduce household income, making it difficult for businesses to grow. This reduces the supply of jobs and aggravates the problems with violence and narcotics. It's something like a destructive death spiral. And yes, I'm sure some of you are thinking, but Grant, we've got to support public services. And you're right, but you know what? Take a look at this. We have graduated kids who can't read. Flat out can't read. Flat out. Illiterate. Can't read. Illiterate. Getting a high school diploma. I had a diploma in their hand, but they couldn't read. That sounds like an exaggeration or hyperbole. It's not. Some research indicates that 77% of high school students in Baltimore have elementary school reading ability and comprehension. It's a total disaster. The question is, who the hell's going to want to move to Baltimore? Visual politics viewers, this city needs to hit the reset button and start from scratch. It wouldn't hurt to copy the economic policies of states like Texas or Florida along the way. If things don't change, this once great city will end up as rubble. If one thing is clear, it is that the democratic plan for Baltimore has not worked at all. But saying this, it's over to you now. What solution would you propose to fix the problems of this city? Leave us your comments below and let's get a debate started. Now, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to all of us here at Visual Politic. All the best, and I'll see you next time.